A very good evening to you and welcome to Rwanda Television News with me, Sam Kalisa. Starting off on Monday, April 19th, 2021, His Excellency Paul Kagame, the President of the Republic of Rwanda, chaired an extraordinary cabinet meeting at uh, Uruguiro Village. The cabinet discussed the investigative report presented uh, and submitted by Levy Firestone Muse LLP entitled uh, A Foreseeable Genocide, the Role of French Government in Connection with the Genocide Against the Tutsi in Rwanda, which was commissioned by the government of Rwanda in 2017. The cabinet commended uh, the outstanding quality of the report and noted the involvement of three Rwandan law firms in its preparation, Certa Law, MRB Artonis, and uh, Trust Law Chambers. The cabinet considers the report as well and as the recent French government commissioned uh, Duclair report to be important contributions to establishing uh, the truth of what happened in connection with the genocide against the Tutsi in Rwanda and the role of France. The cabinet commended the positive steps taken by the government of France under the leadership of President uh, Emmanuel Macron and uh, the prospect and a new chapter in the relations between France and Rwanda. The cabinet directed uh, that supporting uh, documentation used in the preparation of the report become part of the national archives for public use. The cabinet directed that uh, the report be released to the public in full at the earliest possible time. And uh, moving ahead, an investigation report commissioned uh, by the government of Rwanda back in 2017 has concluded that the genocide perpetrated against the Tutsi was foreseeable and that France did nothing to prevent it, despite more than sufficient evidence that uh, it was being prepared and would be implemented. Serge Nore has this report. Titled A Foreseeable Genocide, the Role of the French Government in Connection with the Genocide Against the Tutsi, the investigative report carried out by the Washington, D.C.-based Levy Firestone Muse law firm and commissioned by the government of Rwanda focuses on France's relations with Rwanda starting slightly before 1990 and running through all the way until the genocide against the Tutsi occurred in 1994 and the years after that terrible tragedy. Based on documentation from that era as evidence as well as witness testimonies both here in Rwanda and abroad, the firm's investigators concluded that France played a role in the genocide that was perpetrated against the Tutsi in Rwanda because it did nothing to prevent or stop it and instead continued to support former President Juvenal Habyarimana's regime. Even after the genocide was halted and Rwanda liberated, the French president at the time, Francois Mitterrand, and his government would not budge on their stand something the recently released Duclair report did not delve into. France made that genocide possible, despite it being clear to everybody that it could happen. Also, the two reports of Duclair report investigation in the period ending in 1994, while the one we receive today goes beyond that year and what France did in the years after that, especially efforts by the French authorities of that time to erase evidence of their role. An example would be statements made by different officials, but actually began by President Mitterrand himself, claiming that there had been multiple genocides, implying that another genocide had also occurred, not the genocide that was perpetrated against the Tutsi in 1994. We believe such statements encouraged genocide deniers and those that negate it. Then there are the efforts that were made to undermine the Rwandan government that was established after the genocide. You remember the indictments of up to eight top military officials, indictments that were issued by the judge Bourguer, accusing them of different crimes, and this dragged on for years. I believe only recently did it become evident that his accusations were baseless. This latest report commissioned by the government of Rwanda comes 15 years after the Mucho report and both are important when it comes to uncovering the truth. Most of the investigative work done for the Mucho report occurred here in Rwanda, especially in areas that were covered by the Zone Trucois and other areas where fighting occurred. Certainly this latest report has a bigger international element to it. And even though foreigners were interviewed as part of the Mucho report, this new report has a far greater reach. 
accessing information the first could not, the UN, NGOs and diplomatic documents. However, let me conclude that be it this report or the Duclair one, neither dispute the findings of the Mucho report. They accept those findings so they complement each other. The 600-page report received on Monday clearly shows how the government of France supported a genocidal regime despite all of the evidence of what it was planning, providing that support in many ways that included diplomatic and military aid. So one must wonder what legal implications that could have. Even though the report was prepared by a law firm, the objective was never to uncover crimes that can be presented in a court of law. It was supposed to examine documents and listen to witness accounts to establish the historical facts of the 1994 genocide that was perpetrated against the Tutsi. That's it, which is why those details are also included. But they were never meant to be used for litigation purposes, which is why the government of Rwanda will not use them to seek indictments against any individuals. The reports, however, do not signal the end of anything. These reports we are talking about have been examined and other researchers could use them and the documents that were used to compile them and come to other conclusions, resulting in different outcomes. Let it be clear to those that are wondering if this is the end of the matter, because it is not. Not all issues have been addressed, and it does not mean that France will no longer be asked to explain its role in the genocide that was perpetrated against the Tutsi here in Rwanda. No. This latest report comes after almost four years of investigative work, having been commissioned back in 2017. Thank you, Serge, for that report. Now, judiciaries of Singapore and Rwanda on Monday signed a cooperation agreement meant to improve uh, service delivery and justice sectors of both countries. Gabi Mouvouni has the report. The signing of the agreement was held virtually with the Chief Justice of Rwanda in Kigali, while the Chief Justice of Singapore, accompanied by the Ambassador of Rwanda, was in Singapore. The Chief Justice of Rwanda pointed out that this agreement is aimed at improving functions in the court and mediation as well, as to enable mutual exchange on different matters of interest, such as leveraging information and communications technology to improve the administration of justice. This partnership will focus on key issues, including the use of technology in judicial proceedings, and another focus will be on the use of mediation and other aspects relating to arbitration. This agreement does not only focus on the judiciary, but also on development. He assures that this agreement will improve how judiciaries will work collaboratively to share experiences and the best practices in areas of common interest. This judicial agreement is a model for both investors in Rwanda and Singapore to understand that even when they have a dispute in the courts of Singapore or Rwanda, these issues can be resolved promptly, especially with the use of technology, where one does not need to physically be present in court. Singapore has experience in resolving disputes relating to investment or trade. The agreements will further elevate the outstanding bilateral judiciary relations between both countries. The Chief Justice of Singapore says that this reflects the willingness of both countries in strengthening court management. Rwanda and Singapore are members of the Commonwealth Magistrates and Judges Association, and this is another step forward in bolstering the cooperation between the judiciaries of both countries. Gabi Movuni for RTV. Thank you, Gabi, for that report. Now, a total of uh, 1,398 member civic education program named uh, Indemia Mihigo has commenced. Participants were nominated from district and sector levels and they are being trained using technology. We do have the report. Three participants were nominated from every sector and five participants from every district. They say the training will help them teach the community how to deal with problems around them, plus helping the community to enhance unity and reconciliation. 
itorero mu mashuri nono no kwimaka the civic education program in schools will enhance the use of technology the three trainers will be equipped to help others and the ones in schools will help in teaching values since students and teachers have been at home will be empowered to continue civic education activities ba ubu turakoresha ikoranabuhanga ubundi they were normally trained physically but this time technology will be used we need to teach citizens the history of our country and help them know how civic education were conducted before, which will promote unity and reconciliation right from local levels. However, this Monday, some of the trainees were hindered by connection issues. We had network issues and the sound was not clear enough. We think it was a general problem. The National Itorio Commission says the participants are being trained to assist the commission in delivering these teachings to other sections of Rwandans to the village level. The vice chairperson of the National Itorio Commission, Lieutenant Colonel Migambi Mugamba Desire, says the training were a way to strengthen the commission at the sector and district levels. <laughs> We are training more than 1,398 trainees, adding some local officials. This program might consist of 1,500 people. We did this to empower the civic education program, plus empowering trainers. This will help us to improve the program on the local level, which helps in solving some problems in our communities. On the technology issues encountered in some sectors, the National Itorero Commission chairperson said that they have worked with relevant technology agencies to solve this issue. On many sites, trainees understood what we told them. We are going to work with our partner, RISA, to help us find a solution for such network issues, and it is very possible. In the Nyamihigo Civic Education Program, which began on April 19th and will end on April 25th, 2021 will last for a week. It is the first phase of training through technology that will also train others. Into other matters, more than 15,000 families have been identified as completely wiped out during uh, the genocide perpetrated against the Tutsi and the plan to preserve their history is in the pipeline. Survivors of the 1994 genocide perpetrated against the Tutsi have stressed that such families will never be forgotten. Nagora Majambosko is reading names of the families that were completely wiped out during the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi in Chigabiro Muganza village of Kamonyi district. The family of Siriro Kagawo and his wife Kaitesi Cecilia, their first son was called Muvunyi and the second was called Francoise Uatru. I remember them. But I can't remember others because they were very young. They were wiped out. The family of Karinga Nirekalixt, whose wife was Nyiramusira Consolata, and their children were all killed. Kalisa de Ogracias, his wife and two kids were all killed. Emmanuel, his wife and seven children were completely wiped out. Nyoyita Ejid, a resident of Bujesara district in Nyamatatu village, says he was nine years old at the time of the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi. He says he remembers everything that happened. He is the only survivor of the Inherahamwe militia attack among more than 100 people that had escaped to a pastor's home. Some of the families were completely wiped out. I remember the family of Gachire. I can remember... There was an old son, a lady called Beke, and another one called Mutamari, a young man called Zamani, his son who was the same age as me, called Pirote, and the second last born. Families were completely wiped out, and their homes were demolished, which reflects the brutality of the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi. However, these families will always be remembered by some of those who were their neighbors. How can you forget them? They are always in our hearts. We cannot forget them. Never. There is no way we can forget them, yet we pass here every day. 
He was called Gachire Epimake. He was a teacher and a very humble man. He was always at home with his children. He was friends with my father. Sometimes he could invite my father for a drink. The executive secretary of GRG, a genocide survivors organization that comprises of university graduates and other students in higher learning institutions, Sengiere Fidel says the organization has launched a study to identify families that were completely wiped out during the 1994 genocide perpetrated against the Tutsi from 2009 to 2019, which still continues. And the study has so far identified more than 15,000 families that have been wiped out, made up of more than 68,000 family members. Karonji and Nyamagabe districts have the highest number of wiped out families. Karonji district alone has more than 2,000 families that were wiped out during the genocide against the Tutsi, while Nyagatare district has one wiped out family, and Gatsibo district has 80 families that were completely wiped out. In the study we conducted, the north and the western provinces have the highest numbers of wiped out families. Karonji district has more than 2,000 families that were wiped out, and Nyamagabe district follows. According to the study, this can be linked to how the genocide against the Tutsi was executed and how it was stopped, because the Inghotanyi militia reached the two districts late, plus the Zone 2 Kwas, which favored perpetrators. When you talk to the survivors of the genocide against the Tutsi, they remember some of the members of wiped out families, mostly elders. This brings up worry that the families might be completely forgotten in the future. JRG Executive Secretary Fidel Nsengi says the worry will be addressed in the near future. Commemoration activities for those families will continue. The most important task now is to figure out a way through which these families will never be forgotten because the study was meant to identify them. So we are now planning to write a book about those families. We will make documentaries explaining how those families were wiped out during the genocide against the Tutsi, plus making technological archives on those families and where they lived. It is not easy, because even during this research, people could hardly remember all the names of those family members that were wiped out, especially children. We will continue doing the research, which will facilitate us to get concrete information. The genocide against the Tutsi killed more than one million people and remembering whole families that were completely wiped out is seen as one way of defeating the objective of the perpetrators, which was to annihilate people. On behalf of the entire news and technical team that made it happen, thank you very much for keeping it on RTV News. My name is Sam Kalisa. Have a good evening.